this is Tom from zerodefinals.com. In this video, I'm going to be going through leg ulcers. And you can find written notes on this topic at zerodefinals.com slash leg ulcers or in the vascular surgery section of the Zero Definals surgery book. So let's jump straight in. Leg ulcers are wounds or breaks in the skin that do not heal or heal slowly due to underlying pathology. They have the potential to get progressively larger and become more difficult to heal over time. There are four common types of skin ulcers. Venous ulcers, arterial ulcers, diabetic foot ulcers, and pressure ulcers. Here we're going to mainly cover arterial and venous ulcers. Arterial ulcers result from insufficient blood supply to the skin due to peripheral arterial disease. Venous ulcers occur due to pooling of blood and waste products in the skin, secondary to venous insufficiency. Mixed ulcers are a combination of arterial and venous disease that's causing the ulcer. Before we talk about arterial and venous ulcers, let's talk about some of the other types of ulcers, specifically diabetic foot ulcers and pressure ulcers. Diabetic foot ulcers are more common in patients with diabetic neuropathy. Patients who have lost the sensation in their feet are less likely to realise they've injured their feet or they may have poorly fitting shoes that they don't realise are poorly fitting. Additionally, damage to both the small and the large blood vessels impairs the blood supply and impairs the wound healing. A raised blood sugar level, immune changes and autonomic neuropathy also contribute to ulceration and poor healing. Osteomyelitis, which is infection in the bone, is an important complication of diabetic foot ulcers. Pressure ulcers are typically seen in patients with reduced mobility, where prolonged pressure on particular areas, for example the sacrum while sitting, leads to the skin breaking down. This happens due to a combination of reduced blood supply, causing localised ischemia, reduced lymphatic drainage of the area, and abnormal changes in shape or deformation of the tissues under pressure. Extensive effort needs to be taken to prevent pressure ulcers, including individual risk assessments, regular repositioning, special inflating mattresses, regular skin checks and protective dressings and creams. The Waterloo score is a commonly used risk assessment tool for estimating an individual patient's risk of developing a pressure ulcer. Let's move on to talking about arterial and venous ulcers. There's some key features that can help you distinguish between arterial and venous ulcers. Typically, arterial ulcers occur distally, affecting the toes or the dorsum of the foot or the back of the foot. They're associated with peripheral arterial disease, with absent pulses, pallor of the skin and intermittent claudication symptoms. They're smaller than venous ulcers. They tend to be deeper than venous ulcers. They have a well-defined border and a punched out appearance. They're pale in colour due to the poor blood supply. They're less likely to bleed. They're painful. And the pain tends to be worse at night when the patient is lying horizontally. And the pain is worse on elevating the leg and improves with lowering the leg because gravity helps the circulation. Typically with venous ulcers, they occur in the gaiter area. And the gaiter area is the area between the top of the foot and the bottom of the calf muscle. They're associated with chronic venous changes such as hyperpigmentation, venous eczema and lipodermatosclerosis. They occur after a minor injury to the leg. They tend to be larger than arterial ulcers. They tend to be more superficial than arterial ulcers. 
they have an irregular, gently sloping border, they're more likely to bleed, they're less painful than arterial ulcers, and the pain tends to be relieved by elevation of the leg and worse on lowering the leg. Let's talk about the investigations. An ankle brachial pressure index or ABPI can be used to assess for arterial disease. This is an important investigation in both arterial and venous ulcer assessment. Blood tests may help to assess for infection, for example a full blood count and a CRP, and also for comorbidities, for example a HbA1c for diabetes, a full blood count for anemia, and an albumin level for malnutrition. Skin swabs, specifically charcoal swabs, may be helpful to identify infection where infection is suspected in order to determine the causative organism. A skin biopsy may be required in patients where skin cancer, specifically squamous cell carcinoma, is suspected as a differential diagnosis and this will require a two-week wait referral to a dermatologist to perform the biopsy. Let's talk about the management of arterial ulcers. The management of arterial ulcers is the same as for peripheral arterial disease, with an urgent referral to vascular to consider surgical revascularization. If the underlying arterial disease is effectively treated, the ulcer should rapidly heal. Debridement and compression are not used to treat arterial ulcers. Arterial ulcers are essentially treated by treating the underlying peripheral arterial disease. Let's talk about the management of venous ulcers. The management here is based on the NICE clinical knowledge summaries last updated in January 2021. Patients with venous ulcers may require referral to vascular surgery where mixed or arterial ulcers are suspected, tissue viability or specialist leg ulcer clinics in complex or non-healing ulcers, dermatology where an alternative diagnosis is suspected such as skin cancer, pain clinics if the pain is difficult to manage, and a diabetic ulcer service if the patient has a diabetic ulcer. Patients with venous ulcers require input from experienced nurses such as district nurses or tissue viability nurses. Good wound care involves cleaning the wound, debridement which involves removing the dead tissue and dressing the wound. Compression therapy is used to treat venous ulcers after arterial disease has been excluded with an ABPI or an ankle brachial pressure index because you don't want to compress the leg if there's arterial disease as well as the venous disease. Compression therapy helps blood drain away from the leg and stops it from pooling in the leg, making the situation worse. Pentoxifeline, which is a drug taken orally, can improve healing in venous ulcers. However, be aware that this is not a licensed indication. Antibiotics can be used to treat any infection that's present. And analgesia is used to manage pain. However, avoid non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs as they can worsen the condition. If you like this video, consider joining the Zero to Finals Patreon account where you get early access to these videos before they appear on YouTube. You also get access to my comprehensive course on how to learn medicine and do well in medical exams, digital flashcards for rapidly testing the key facts you need for medical exams, early access to the Zero to Finals podcast episodes, and question podcasts which you can use to test your knowledge on the go. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.